Well, good evening. I'm Deborah Taylor, um, and I am a co-chair of um, an organization here at All Souls called Unitarian Universalists for Justice in the Middle East. Um, this program this evening is co-sponsored um, by Lifelines, which is a, 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 a regular program that we have here at All Souls that um, brings in people and has discussions on very complex issues. Um, Mary Geisman, who is our former co-chair of UUJME, uh, has moved on to great things. Um, not greater, but great things. Uh, uh, is going to introduce Phyllis Bennis. It's my great pleasure to introduce my friend, Phyllis Bennis. Phyllis is a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. She is the director of the new international project there. And she has um, been a writer, analyst, and activist on issues of the Middle East and peace uh, for many years. So it is now my great pleasure to call Phyllis up here to talk about current issues in the Middle East. Well, thank you all. You know, when we first talked about how to frame tonight's discussion and presentation, we were sort of talking about it in kind of two parts, that there would be stuff about the Arab Spring, and then sort of how does Israel-Palestine fit into that. And that was a couple of months ago. Things have gotten a whole lot worse. So what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about sort of the, the framework, what we're looking at in the region right now, what the challenges are, and they are enormous, but not try and go into too much detail. Just so all of you know, I'm working right now on a new primer. That one's going to be called Understanding ISIS and the New Global War on Terror. And it's due to be published in April, and of course I haven't finished it yet, so I'm very late. Um, just to say. And then I would talk about sort of what are the developments in the Israel-Palestine side of things, what's going on at the UN, the International Criminal Court, that whole range of issues. And then we'll have a discussion. We'll talk, right? So. The State of the Union, I wasn't expecting very much about foreign affairs in general and not about the Middle East. I think President Obama is going to really keep the focus a lot on the economy because he thinks that's where things are going well. I'm guessing he didn't see yesterday's announcement by Oxfam. Did you all see that new report? It's really shocking, not surprising, but shocking that 80 people in the world, 80 people, you know, half of you all have enough wealth to, to match all of the wealth owned by the bottom 50% of the people in the world. And next year, 2016, the 1%, you all remember Occupy and the 1%, the 1% will have as much wealth as the 99%. Un uh, not only unemployment, but inequality is on the rise. And yet, we're going to hear tonight, I promise you, that the state of our economy is good, that we're on the upswing, because Wall Street is on the upswing. And that's the big problem. We are going to hear a little bit. I just got an advanced copy of parts of the speech. And we are going to hear just a little bit. I thought there would be a little bit of Je suis Charlie. There would be a little bit about what happened, the horrors of what happened in France 10 days ago. I think we're also going to hear a little bit of a request from the president. He's going to request from Congress that they draft and pass what's known as an AUMF, an authorization for the use of military force. If you remember, the last couple of AUMFs have been used quite broadly. The first one that was passed just a couple of days after 9-11 that gave full authority to the president to go to war against anyone associated with, by his judgment or anybody else's, associated with those who were responsible for the attacks of 9-11 for as long as it takes anywhere in, the war, in, anywhere in the world with no restrictions of geography, of time, of weapons, of opponent, of victims, or anything else. Another one was passed the following year to authorize war in Iraq, and you all remember what happened there. And now that it's been several years that President Obama has been relying on these earlier authorizations to go to war in a completely different environment against completely different people, different organizations, 
in a different era, he's now saying, well, I'd like Congress to come forward with a new authorization. I'm guessing they will do that. I don't think we're going to hear very much about Israel-Palestine. I don't think we're going to hear about the war in Syria. I don't think we're going to be hearing about, we may hear a little bit about how ISIS is on the run. I wish that were true, but unfortunately it's not yet true, and at this rate will never be true because what the U.S. is doing is making things worse, not better in many ways. I don't think we're going to hear much about the Iran negotiations, which actually is something that President Obama could legitimately brag about. But unfortunately, I think he's going to see it as not something to brag about, but as something to be ashamed of. And so he's not going to talk very much about it. He's also going to not talk, well, he's not going to talk about a whole lot of things. That's part of the problem. You know, what we saw in Paris 10 days ago, is it 10 days, almost two weeks? It seems, it's only been a few days. I mean, it seems like it's been forever, is very much, again, the wars that we wage around the world coming home. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's shocking and it's brutal and it's something that we have to take very seriously. We saw in the early periods of the Obama administration a president who was elected and who campaigned on the goal of ending wars. I'm going to end the war in Iraq because it's a dumb war, he said. He said, I'm not against all wars, but I'm against dumb wars. I'm against stupid wars. That's a pretty good position. He said, I'm going to pull our troops out of Iraq. And he did. Under duress, he actually tried not to. He really wanted to keep a lot of troops in Iraq, but the Iraqi parliament was having none of it because to keep US troops in Iraq, you have to give them complete immunity from being held accountable for any war crimes. The Iraqi parliament wasn't prepared to do that anymore. They had done that for years, and they were saying, enough is enough. We don't need this anymore. If you can't keep your troops from committing war crimes, take them home. And so President Obama brought them all home. That was a good thing. And now they're back. 3,000 more on the way. We're bombing. We're bombing Syria. We've escalated the bombings by drones in Yemen. Yemen is on the verge of complete collapse. A coup is imminent. You probably have all been hearing about this. Uh, the situation in, in Yemen is a disaster. The situation in Libya, you remember that? Where many people said, it's not going to do what you say it's going to do. This is not about humanitarian protection. This is a, a, an excuse for regime change. No, no, this is only to protect civilians. Well, guess what? Guess how long it took before it changed into regime change? And guess what happened after regime change? disaster. This is what we have facing us today. The situation in Libya is a nightmare for people who live in Libya. And throughout the region, from North Africa down through Mali and into Central Africa, as well as throughout the Middle East, the weapons that are fueling the wars in particularly Iraq as well as Iraq, uh, particularly Syria as well as Iraq, are coming largely from, wait for it, Libya. Because when you overthrow a regime, repressive as that regime may have been, you also destroy the military that took some responsibility for all the weapons that had poured into that country. And now those weapons are God knows where. The weapons storage bins were thrown open to whoever wanted them, and we see the results. So this has been a pretty sad result of the first years of the Arab Spring. I'm not prepared to give up on the Arab Spring. You know, the situation in Egypt is a nightmare. It's a disaster. There was a military coup that overthrew a democratically elected, the first democratically elected president of, of Egypt. There had never been one before. Now granted, the military maintained control when Pro President Mohamed Morsi took power. He didn't have a whole lot of power. There weren't a lot of decisions he could make. And granted, those decisions he could make, he pretty much screwed up every one of them. He pretty much made the wrong decision everywhere he had the opportunity to make any decision. But nonetheless, he was a democratically elected president for the first time. And the military decided, no, we're just not going to go along with this. And unfortunately, a lot of people in, in, in Egypt took the position, well, we've done it before. If we don't like him, if we don't like the next one, we'll get rid of him too. 
So we'll go out in the streets and demand that Morsi be overthrown. So it looked like it was a popular uprising, except it was the military who actually threw the guy out who actually went to the presidential palace and took him into custody. He's still in custody. He's facing the death penalty. He's being blamed for the military shooting at demonstrations. So it's, it's not good. But at the end of the day, I think that people don't forget things so easily. I think that in Egypt, there are plenty of people who came into Tahrir Square saying, we want to claim our rights as citizens for the first time. We want bread and dignity. We don't want just handouts. We want a dignified life where we have some control over our government, where we decide how much religion there should or shouldn't be in our government, where we can have jobs, we can feed our kids, we can go to school, the basics. People wanted the basics. And I don't think that people forgot that by mobilizing in the streets, by filling Tahrir Square, they accomplished something enormous. There's a great film you're going to be able to see in a little while. It's called We Are Many. It's a film about the protests of February 15, 2003, the day the world said no to war. How many of you were in the streets here in New York that day? There were somewhere around a half a million people on First Avenue, not far from here, right in front of the UN. And it extended for blocks and blocks and blocks up into the 70s, into the 80s. We couldn't see anymore how far it went. And around the world, there were protests on that same day in 665 cities in every continent, including Antarctica, where the scientists at the Murdu station went out and held, made a peace sign in the snow holding hands in their bright orange jackets. And the people in Egypt had a protest also. But they couldn't get very many people out. And they were really embarrassed. And they said, and they're in the film, these Egyptians, these amazing Egyptians, who said, you know, we were looking around the world and we were seeing these white, whiskey-swilling infidels in their millions who were out protesting a war in our neighborhood against us, against people like us. And we said, we've got to do that. And they tried. but. It didn't go very far. And they said, we've got to do better. And sure enough, they said that was the beginning of the democracy movement that led straight to Tahrir Square. So I don't think things are over yet. I think it's going to get better in, e in Egypt. I'm not so sure when. I don't know what's going to happen in Syria. I don't know what's going to happen in Libya. Right now, anything is possible. You've probably all heard the news yesterday. The Israelis uh, were shelling. In the, in the Syrian-controlled Golan Heights, not the Israeli-occupied part of the Golan Heights. And they killed six Hezbollah fighters, one of whom was the son of the great martyr of Hezbollah, who was assassinated by the Israelis in 2008. And they also killed an Iranian general who was there. And it turns out that this general is a close, was a close colleague of the supreme leader in Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei. That means that there's going to be enormous political pressure on the government in Iran to respond. There's going to be enormous political pressure from their base on Hezbollah to respond. So even though Iran and Hezbollah and the Syrian regime and Israel and the US and Turkey and Saudi Arabia and all the countries in the region have all been intervening all over Syria, they've all been kind of careful, tacitly, not to target each other. That may be over. The next 24 or 48 hours, we could see some pretty grim developments. But what we're seeing now is pretty grim also. President Obama never said he was going to end the war in Afghanistan. And indeed, he is not. That war is still going on. There are still 25,000 US troops there. They announced that they're going to keep somewhere around 15,000, maybe 10, somewhere in that area. Not till the end of this year, but another year after that. Maybe who knows after that. The drone war in Yemen and Somalia are both escalating. The global war on terror is escalating. 
You know about the Tuesday morning kill meetings at the White House where every week they go through and decide who should be on the list of who can be killed. They're killing people rather than arresting them. This is part of the plan to shut down Guantanamo. We won't capture people that we say are terrorists. We'll just kill them. So the notion of this being an anti-war presidency has not really played out the way it was supposed to. Now, there are some good developments. In Iran, the negotiations are going forward. It's not going to be easy. There's deadlines coming up. March 1st, a deadline for a, a framework agreement. July 1st, to have a full agreement with all of the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the um, details of the, how it's going to work are supposed to be figured out by then. And in the meantime, Congress is already talking about new sanctions, which they've been told, and they know full well, is what they used to say nicely is a game changer. Iran has been very clear. U.S. officials have been very clear. The Obama administration is very clear that passing new sanctions resolutions will prevent any resolution from being signed. And we should be very clear that those in Congress who want to scuttle the negotiations, their alternative is war. So they need to be called on it and say, are you for war instead of negotiations? And not be allowed to weasel, not be allowed to say, well, I'm for negotiations, but I don't like these terms. They don't get to set the terms for the other side. They don't get to set the terms. If they want negotiations, there have to be negotiations and not new sanctions. So that's what we're facing. APAC has been all over the place demanding new sanctions. It's APAC are the only ones who got the, the uh, text of the resolution. They circulated it day before yesterday. Nobody else could get it. None of the offices in Congress could get the text of the resolution. APAC had it. They put it on their website. Now, it may have been an earlier one, might not be right. I'm not going to vouch for it being accurate, but it's the only one out there. And I don't know if it's accurate or not, but it's the only one there. And nobody has come forward and said, that's not accurate. So I'm, for the moment, going with accurate. And it's a pretty scary reality. Because with new sanctions, it means war. It means no agreement. So we're facing a very dangerous moment throughout the region. The escalation of brutal killings by ISIS, by Al-Qaeda, has been a horrific reality that for people in that region, is, it's going to be a generation scarred by those attacks. And unfortunately, many of the policies that the US has put in place to respond has made things worse and not better. I'm hoping against hope that the French don't follow the model of what we did in this country in the wake of 9-11. You know, it wasn't really 9-11 that changed the world. 9-11 was a horrific crime, a crime against humanity, a horrific, evil act. But it didn't threaten the existence of the United States. It didn't threaten the world. 9-12, when George Bush said, we will take the world to war, that's what threatened the world. And we're seeing the results of that now. We're seeing that even now. I'm hoping that the French president, Hollande, when he said, we are at war, I'm hoping that, unlike George Bush, he meant that rhetorically and not as a reality of policy. I'm hoping that going to war, expanding war, and a French Patriot Act, which they're talking about, will not be the choices that France makes. Because we've seen what the result has been when our country made those choices. So the question then becomes, I know all of you here tonight, or most of you, are interested in the Israel-Palestine side of all of this. So I thought I would shift a little bit to talk about that. But don't forget the context in which all of this is going forward. It's a very grim moment. Um, you know, there's a, a debate going on 
uh, right now at the McCain Center in Washington. They're having a, a debate, I think tomorrow or the next day. And the question they've posed is, should the, yet, should the US do more in Syria about ISIS, something like that? And I found that an astonishing question because it doesn't say anything. The implication is more means military. So I think the military things we have done have made things dramatically worse, not better. They have encouraged more people to join ISIS because you know the leadership of ISIS, I agree with you, it's a seventh century ideology, but the people who get attracted to it come to it from a lot of different vantage points. Some are straight up thugs who are attracted by the violence. Some, many, and unfortunately this is the, the big problem in Syria, are ordinary Sunnis, uh, sorry, not in Syria, in Iraq, I'm mixing up my countries, in Iraq, ordinary Sunnis and particularly the Sunni tribal leaders have flocked somewhat to the ISIS banner, not because of, but despite their level of violence, because they see the violent attacks by the US-backed Iraqi government, which has been bombing Sunni communities, et cetera, as worse. Now, I'm not there, I'm not Sunni, I, you know, I'm not in a position to tell them which is more of an immediate danger to them at that moment. But I do know that that's part of why some of them are moving with ISIS. The US needs to do enormously more than it is, but it's not military. So it needs to do a whole set of, of diplomatic moves. It needs to do a whole set of opening new negotiations, not with ISIS, that's not what we're talking about. But it needs to negotiate with those tactical allies, for example, that we're seeing in Syria right now. There needs to be a resumption of real talks that include talks about a, an arms embargo. Because you can talk all you want about a ceasefire or whatever, as long as the arms are flooding in to both sides, which they are right now, there's no reason for anybody to take it seriously. So there needs to be first talk and then action about an arms embargo. There needs to be far more money being spent on the refugees. The US has done better than most countries on that, but not nearly enough. Given our responsibility for starting the chaos in that region with the invasion of Iraq, we owe a great deal to people in that region, and we have not paid nearly what we owe. So there's that question. There's a whole series of things. I, I wrote a piece for The Nation a, a little while ago that was called something like six things the US should do not going to war, that you know, sort of go through that. But it's absolutely right to say it, it's not something that we can ignore, um, but we have to fight the mindset that says that the only option is military because the military, in fact, makes things worse and not better. Another question. Well, I think there are many companies that profit from war. We could start with those that produce the weapons, General Electric, General Dynamics, Lockheed, etc. cetera. Uh, there's the ones who produce the, uh, the infrastructure for Israeli occupation, like Caterpillar and Motorola and some others. Uh, there's lists of corporations that do evil around the world that, that are far greater than five. There's thousands of corporations that are directly responsible for some of these wars. And unfortunately, they have far too much influence in the United States, in our Congress, in the White House, and in the Pentagon. Well, I'm not saying that any of them are falling apart solely because of the United States. I think that these countries all had internal um, struggles, issues, challenges. But what made everything worse was the US, and in the case of Libya, the US NATO airstrikes that from the moment they were voted on at the UN, where for reasons that I to this day do not understand, countries like Russia and China and others that historically have never accepted the claim that military action for so-called humanitarian purposes was, was valid, accepted that. And when people said, but it's going to be regime change, they said, no, it isn't. They promised. Well, we know what that promise was like. So what resulted from the overthrow of Gaddafi has been a horrific level of violence throughout Libya. 
the expansion of arms, not even arms trade, it's just the free flow of arms out of that country into Mali. It's one of the, one of the reasons that, that Mali... Libyans that this is Libyans... I'm sorry? It's the yes, Libyans have agency. And some Libyans... Libyans... Yes, and Libyans called for U.S. military intervention. There are those in Syria who have been calling for U.S. military intervention too. There are others in Libya, others in Syria, who say no to U.S. intervention. The fact that some in those countries have called for it, in my view, does not make it either a necessity, since when does the U.S. listen to what people want, uh, nor does it make it right. I understand why people who feel desperate will ask for desperate help. The problem is there are consequences, and we've seen that consequence we anticipated it in Libya. People were writing about it, talking about it from the moment that it first was proposed by the Italians, when the US was still saying no. From that moment on, the discussion was about what the consequence was going to be. And it was predicted almost exactly what, was, what, was, uh, what, what in fact happened. So it's absolute, you're absolutely right. There is agency in all of these countries. The Syrian spring was carried out by Syrians, not by the United States as was the, the Cairo Spring, Tunisia, the one sort of success story so far. But I think my position is that the militarization of those conflicts has made everything worse. And the US willingness to move militarily in all these conflicts is not because of humanitarian considerations, but because of strategic considerations. And they have made the situations worse. And they have lost the ability to call for stability, which has always been a major US goal uh, in that region. Oil, Israel, and stability were always the kind of triplet of, of US interests. Uh, there is no stability. But it's particularly dangerous for people in those countries. They are the ones suffering from it far more than the United States. But we are here, and we need to do things to hold our government accountable. And one of those, I think, is we need to have alternatives to war. The question that came up earlier about are you saying we should just do nothing? No, absolutely not. We have a ton of work to do. But step number one is do no harm. And the militarization of those conflicts by our government has done enormous harm. Thank you all. Thank you.